so it, this is a large topic. So what I've tried to do is include those things which would perhaps help to do away with a diagnostic arthroscopy. I think the days have come when there really is no role for a diagnostic arthroscopy. Technical aspects, I would recommend that any joint imaging is done on a high field strength scanner. 3T if it is available, otherwise at least 1.5. We always use a dedicated uh, knee coil, dedicated shoulder coil, because the part to be imaged is closest to the coil. So the images that we get are really, really good. Doesn't take more than about 10 to 12 minutes. So there really is no role for claustrophobia here. I don't do an arthrogram at all, unless I'm looking at a post-op uh, study, because even a little amount of fluid is enough to look at the structures, both in the shoulder and the knee. We image in three different planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal. And when we look for pathology, you should be able to see any pathology in at least two planes. Just seeing it in one plane is simply not good enough. I tell our radiology residents and fellows, and I'm telling the younger people here as well, that you familiarize yourself with how normal looks. When you know what normal looks like, it's not that difficult to pick up abnormal, especially because you guys are surgeons, you know the normal anatomy. So it's not that difficult, provided you familiarize yourself with what's normal. Okay. So if somebody asks you, what is the one film that you should pick? you pick the T2 or the PD or the STIR. These are the fluid sensitive sequences. The reason for this is that against that backdrop of fluid, pathology is picked up very easily, okay? Fortunately for us, most of the important structures of the body, tendons, ligaments, menisci, all of these are black when they are normal. The moment they turn gray or white, there's something going on with them, okay? The exception to this is cartilage. Cartilage is gray. But even that, when it is damaged or deficient, what you will see is bright, all right? So pick the fluid sequence. Do you see this? Yeah, all right. So quickly with the anatomy. Um, I'll start with the shoulder and with the coronal sequences. We'll just run through this really, really fast. Starting from the anterior side, you start seeing the bicipital tendon coming up and going into the joint. Go a little more posterior. That bicipital tendon has gone further. It's heading towards the superior labrum. This is the point where you start seeing the supraspinatus tendon. Down here, you'll see the inferior labrum. You can see the IGHL and the joint capsule very beautifully. Go a little further back, you start seeing the infraspinatus, and still further back, you will get the teraspinal. On the axial images, we look for the subscapillaris tendon. Now, whenever we image the subscapillaris, we always image it in external rotation because normally a patient in pain will lie with the shoulder a little bit adducted. Then what happens is what is happening here? You get a bunched up version of the subscapillaris and then that sometimes get mis gets mistaken for tendinosis and so on. These are the sequences in which you see the anterior labrum and the posterior labrum. These are triangular dark structures sitting on the bone. There should be no signal in between the labrum and the underlying cartilage or bone. And as you go further up, you start seeing the bicipital tendon. The sagittal is actually my favorite sequence to look at because you can actually see everything on this. Hmm? Starting from the outer side, you see the footprints of all the rotator cuff tendons. Come further in, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor down here. The subscap tendon normally looks like this. These are not tears. This is the fluid in between the slips of the tendon. Okay, not to be mistaken for tears. And this space here is the rotator interval. You see the bicipital tendon coming in nicely. You can see the coracohumeral on top and the glenohumeral lig ligament below it. Go further inside. Now, I think this is the one thing that all radiology, I don't know if there are any radiology people here, but your sagittal images have to be positioned like I have shown here, exactly parallel to the glenoid, because then you can see the entire labrum, most of it anyway, in one plane. And as you go further in, 
the Y view where you can see the rotator cuff muscle bellies. Rotator cuff, I often get asked this, why should I do an MRI? I'm suspecting a cuff injury, okay? So the answer to that is you probably don't need to do an MRI. An ultrasound will usually suffice because it will, in the hands of a good ultrasonologist, it will give you how much is the tear and how much is the retraction and all of that. But when you are looking at young patients or patients who have had high grade trauma, you may be also addressing labral injury or cartilage injury and all of that will not be seen on the ultrasound. Secondly, the quality of the muscle as, a, as regards the fatty changes in the muscle cannot reliably be seen on ultrasound. Trauma, as I said earlier, then we're looking, when we're looking at cuff arthropathy, okay, um, prior to replacement, it is a good idea to look for the status of the cuff and the status of the cartilage on MRI. And finally, I think this is probably most important that the ultrasound is normal, but the patient is symptomatic. What does MRI give you? It tells you the thickness of the tear, as in this case, where this entire tendon is torn. It tells you how much it is retracted from the footprint. It tells you the condition of the muscle belly. What it doesn't, oops, what it doesn't tell you is the status of the free edge of the tendon. I get asked this all the time. What is the status of the edge of the tendon? Is it fibrotic? Is it tendinosed? Is it nice and clean? You know. Now, unfortunately, we can tell you tendinosis, but I cannot tell you whether that edge of the tendon is clean or good enough to be brought down and fixed again, okay? It's unreliable. I can tell you there's tendinosis, but exact quality of that tendon, I cannot tell you. The partial thickness insertional tears can be either articular surface, as in this case, then in this, we can tell you the thickness of the tear, and on the sagittal views, the anteroposterior extent of the tear. And same thing with the bursal sided tears. I think this is one place where it scores over ultrasound in that I can now look at the muscle bellies nicely. I can tell you whether there is any fatty infiltration there. For example, this supraspinatus muscle belly, the size is reduced, but the fatty infiltration is not all that much. Whereas the infraspinatus muscle belly, there is a whole lot of fatty infiltration. Now, one more thing, again, this is for the radiologists present here. Make sure that the sagittal images go far medial. What happens is when the supras supraspinatus tears, it gets retracted. And what you may see on this Y view is actually the edge of the muscle belly. You're not seeing the entire muscle belly. And then you get a false representation of a reduced size of the muscle belly. So urge the radiologists and the technicians to go further medial so that you get the entire size of the muscle belly. Impingement is a clinical diagnosis, but we can suggest it with a lateral downsloping of the acromion. You may be able to identify the bony spur, may be able to see a thickened acromial attachment of the coracoacromial ligament. And here the impingement is quite obvious. But absence of visible impingement on an MRI does not exclude impingement. They may still be because it's a dynamic process. Calcific tendonitis I have mentioned here because MRI can miss it because it's calcium. You may or may not pick it up in this. It's really, really obvious. In fact, you may not even see it on CT. And this is one place where ultrasound scores. Sometimes the very soft calcification is best picked up on ultrasound. So if you're suspecting calcific tendonitis and you do not see it on the MRI, it's worthwhile taking the patient into the ultrasound suite and taking a look at that tendon and seeing if you can see soft calcification. I've put subscap tears here because these are slightly different from the others. Subscap, like I said, we view an external rotation so that you get a nice length of tendon seen. What happens to the vertical segment of the long head of biceps? It should normally sit here in the bicepital groove. What happens with the tear is it slips out. And as in this patient, this is the rest of the tendon and that bicepital rest of the subscapularis tendon and the bicepital tendon is now sitting inside it. This is called the fish mouth sign. Or you can get like a near complete tear and that bicepital tendon has now gone into the joint much before it normally should. In case of trauma, it's a good idea to do cross-sectional imaging simply because you may not see this kind of a fracture on the x-rays. You'll certainly not see it on ultrasound. Sometimes we go ahead and do a CT just to look for the degree of displacement. 
moving on to the slap tears. Now, slap tears, very often in people above the age of 50, you will get some signal here. All of them are not slap tears. That tear has to involve the bicipital labral junction. Like I discussed earlier, this is the superior labrum. That is the long head of biceps, and that is the junction. This junction normally has no signal. If you start getting signal here, it means there is something going on, either degeneration or the beginnings of a tear. As in this patient here, where you have a signal in the labrum and you have a signal at the junction. When I take a sagittal through this, I can actually see the extent of the tear. We describe this extent by clock position with this being 12 o'clock, this being nine o'clock, six o'clock, and the anterior part is three o'clock. Clock position remains the same for both shoulders. So this tear would probably be nine to maybe one o'clock. Like I described, this is why we do these oblique sagittal images, because you can then give a clock position to the tear. Rarely, you see something like a bucket handle tear, where, again, that is the vertical, sorry, horizontal segment of the long head of biceps. This is where the superior labrum should have been. What is happening is it's come here. It sort of got displaced into the joint. Same thing seen on the sagittal, like a bucket handle tear that you see in the knee. These are sometimes associated with these paralabral cysts. MR is useful because it will tell you the size of the cyst. It will tell you whether it is going into the supraglenoid, sorry, the suprascapular and the spinoglenoid recesses. It will tell you the status of the muscle bellies and whether there's any compression and denervation of those muscle bellies. I've put uh, this slide here because I often find that people ask for this ABR, ABR protocol or the shoulder viewed in abduction and external rotation at whim. Everything and everything cannot be solved with the ABR protocol. The ABR protocol is such that that shoulder is abducted and externally rotated. The point behind the ABR protocol is that you're stretching the anterior structures of the shoulder. So it is basically done to view these anterior structures well, the anterior labrum well. All right. So in those instances where we cannot identify anterior labral or antero inferior labral or anterior band IGHL tears, we do this, this kind of an ABO protocol because then you can sometimes pick up those tears which are not seen otherwise. In addition, the undersurface of the supraspinatus tendon is also very beautifully seen in this. Otherwise, that ABO protocol is quite useless. Moving on to anterior instability, like I said earlier, the, anterior, the labrum should be a triangular black structure, nothing seen in between the labrum and the bone. The moment you start getting signal, like in this patient here, that means it is torn. When you take a sagittal view, you see the rest of the labrum quite nicely, but say from approximately three o'clock to five o'clock, it is missing, and that's where it's torn, and there is some marrow edema in the underlying glenoid. Now, this question is discussed at all radiology meetings. Should you just do an MRI, or should you do an additional CT to look for glenoid bone loss? My answer to this is it all depends on what setup you're in. If you're dealing with young people, athletes, people with a lot of requirement for that shoulder, it's a good idea to do a CT because you will get a more accurate assessment of glenoid bone loss. If you're dealing with some with patients who are about 65, 70, 75, who are not really doing any kind of athletic or, you know, overthrowing activities and so on, an MRI may suffice. Hmm? The way to do the MRI is that we take what is called the best fit circle method. That is a circle is put on top of the glenoid to cover approximately two thirds of the length of the glenoid. Then we know what this area is, and we know what bone loss has occurred. And when you divide one by the other, you get the percentage of bone loss. Whereas in CT, what you have to do is you have to get axial images of both shoulders. Then you do these kind of sagittal reformats. You measure the AP dimension of the normal. You measure the AP dimension of the abnormal at the same level, which is why this measurement is there. We take the same measurement and you put it here and you measure the abnormal. And then you, you, know, you divide the abnormal by the normal and then you know how much of bone loss there is. Now, there is one school of thought that says that using CT and these measurements sometimes overestimates and using MR tends to underestimate. So you have to decide based on what kind of practice you're dealing with. Bipolar bone loss. So now it's not enough just to measure glenoid. You have to check how much of bone loss has occurred on the humeral side as well. Hmm? So MR will tell you that. It will tell you the transverse extent and it will tell you the 
supero inferior extent, it will also tell you the depth. But we do a CT because we are looking for whether that particular glenoid is on track or not. What is this concept of tracking of the glenoid? I think most of you probably know it, but I'm just going to go over the radiology part of it. The normal glenoid track is calculated at 83% of the AP dimension of a normal shoulder glenoid. Okay, If it is less than that, that humeral head sometimes tends to slip over the antero-inferior margin in the abducted and externally rotated position of the shoulder. How do we measure this? We take 3D images of the normal and the abnormal. Glenoid track, like I said, is 83% of this dimension. So I calculate this dimension and I take 83% of that. That is the normal glenoid track. Now I take turn my attention to the injured shoulder and I measure how much I take the same size of the circle on this side. Measure how much this distance is. And from that glenoid track, I subtract the bone loss. And that gives you the glenoid track of the injured shoulder. Okay. Once I have the glenoid track of the injured shoulder, I turn my attention to the humeral head. I find this nice position of the humeral head. Our technicians are trained to do that so that you can see the hill sacs nicely. You take the medial margin of the hill sacs and you calculate the distance from the medial attachment of the rotator cuff. Now, there are errors in this. It all depends on how that 3D is made, how it is rotated. You know, you can't leave it to the technicians. I do these measurements myself and they're fairly accurate. So if that hill sacs index comes larger than the glenoid track of the injured shoulder, very likely it is an off-track glenoid, which means that if you just do soft tissue reconstruction, it is not going to be enough. That person is going to re-dislocate. Bicipital tendon just the normal anatomy on the axials, that's the vertical segment as it comes up and then it comes into the shoulder joint. Same thing seen on the coronal images, the vertical segment comes into the joint, comes here and comes and attaches to the superior labrum. Rotator interval is important because youngsters, especially those guys who gym a lot, will have injuries in this area and Patients with adhesive capsulitis will have injuries here or will have problems here. Again, adhesive capsulitis is a clinical diagnosis. Normal MRI does not rule it out. Okay, Only if you get findings like this, signal in the rotator interval and signal along the IgHL, these are imaging findings which corroborate with adhesive capsulitis. Now we'll move on to the knee. Technical aspects remain the same. Absolutely the same, except that we use a knee coil. Normal anatomy on sagittals. The midline images will show you the ACL. Bear in mind, this distal part of the ACL often looks like this. Look at this. It's not like this. It's not black. Inside the distal ACL, that's normal. That's not sprain, strain, partial tear, none of that. Okay. Go a little bit to the medial side, you see the inverted hockey stick appearance of the PCL. In these midline images, you will also see the quadriceps and the patellar tendons, the quadriceps fat pad, and the Hoffa's fat pad. On the slightly parasagittal images, you see the bow tie appearance of the menisci. They are triangular structures. They should always have sharp margins. There should be no signal inside of it unless it is torn or degenerated. And here, what I have marked on this are the meniscopopliteal fascicles of the lateral meniscus. The coronals will also identify the ACL and the PCL. But better seen on this is the MCL, the superficial MCL and the deep fibers of the MCL. This is the deep MCL. You can't see this one so well. The lateral collateral ligament, which is coming together with the biceps femoris to attach here onto the head of the fibula. You also see the bodies of the menisci, medial and lateral. Once again, triangular structures with sharp margins and no internal signal. The axials are used basically to assess the patellofemoral compartment, the cartilage there, the lateral patellar retinaculum, the medial patellofemoral ligament, slightly lower down the medial patellar retinaculum. You'll start seeing the attachments of the MCL 
and slightly posterior, the lateral collateral ligament. You see the attachments of the ACL and the PCL. And as you come further down, you will see the C-shaped meniscal structures. Acute ACL tear, one does not need to do an MRI. It's a clinical diagnosis, but you should be familiar with what is it that you see. So you can either get just a very ill-defined, dirty, soft tissue sitting in the joint, or you may get actual avulsion from here. And look at this ligament. It's sort of buckled into the anterior intercondylar notch. That's the tibial attachment buckling like this and we always give this measurement in our reports because that is the ap dimension of the tibial footprint it is useful as sachin just said in assessing in trying to decide what is the kind of graft that you might want to use and in children this is the injury we get where because the ligaments are stronger than the bone the entire bone gets avulsed off the parent bone so this is what normal should look like it's predominantly dark but the posterior part of the ACL often shows a little bit of bright signal. Okay, so that's the normal fluid in between the fibers of the ACL. So ACL tear, you know, that whole morphology is gone. What happens if you get something like this? Okay, now I don't know whether this is normal, whether there's some sprain, some strain, some whatever, because there is some effusion, the patient is a little bit lax. These are the instances where this oblique imaging that we do is very useful because the ACL is not viewed in one single plane on the sagittal or the coronals. What we do is we take the sagittal image and we drop a line in along that ACL. So it's like a coronal oblique. So you start seeing the fibers of the ACL a lot better, both the anterior and the posterior. Similarly, we get nice sagittal images. You take the coronal scan, midline coronal, and we drop these exactly along the line of the ACL. So you will start getting the anteromedial and the posterolateral bundles very nicely seen. You can see the footprint also very, very nicely. Quick example, she was a young doctor with a history of a twisting injury. And if you look at it, this looks okay. Maybe it's slightly thin. Maybe there's some signal in here. But when you do, and if you look at the coronals from anterior to posterior, I see the attachment on the tibia quite nicely. I see one structure here. I see one structure here. But if you look here, only the anteromedial bundle attachment is nicely seen. And there's nothing seen below that. So this lady actually had a PLB injury, just an isolated injury of the PLB. And you see it very beautifully on the oblique images. We took these oblique images. Now you're able to see the anteromedial bundle. And if you go further back, I see nothing here except some tiny black strands. So this person had an isolated injury of the PLB. PCL, normal inverted hockey stick appearance. Very rarely will you see this, that you just see an out and out full tear of the PCL. This is what we normally see, where you just see a thickened, swollen, edematous PCL. How do I know that it's abnormal? So we calculate the anteroposterior diameter. Maximum diameter should usually not be more than seven millimeters. And in this instance, if you see the ligament, look at these. This, this is the ligament of Humphrey, the black dot here. And the black dot posteriorly is the ligament of Risberg. And both of them seem to be incorporated into the PCL. Okay, that should not normally happen. It obviously means that there is an injury to the PCL. For the posterolateral corner, usually, again, it's a clinical thing. It is assessed on table, but it is useful if you know something about it before surgery. So we always address it in our reports. The lateral collateral ligament, biceps femoris are very nicely seen. The popliteal tendon is also very nicely seen. The popliteal fibular ligament is very nicely seen. And the posterior joint structures are nicely seen. So when they are injured, you can see that as well on the MRI. We discussed this earlier, the meniscopopliteal fascicles, they're really beautifully seen. So when they are torn, they are torn. You can see it if you look for it. Or you can get a high-grade injury, like in this person. This biceps femoris has attached here, but this whole bone has come off. See, there's nothing here. The entire thing has come off. So this is a high-grade posterolateral corner injury. Quickly about the anterolateral ligament, where should you look for it? identify the iliotibial band. Once you've identified that, you go slightly behind and you will see another structure which is sort of running parallel to that iliotibial band, but going from the femoral condyle down to the tibia. 
and that would be your anterolateral ligament. And then you go further back and you start seeing the lateral collateral ligament. That is the attachment of the popliteus tendon. So look for the iliotibial band and just go a little bit behind. Most of the times you will be able to identify it. And in a patient with an ACL tear, that is a Segond's fracture, nicely seen on the MR here. So we are trying to use this device. It's a device which tries to simulate the uh, clinical testing that you'll do for the ACL, where you try and move the tibia forwards and look for laxity. So we are objectively trying to measure how much of anteroposterior or rotational instability there is when there is an ACL tear plus or minus PLC. This is still under, I mean, we're still doing patients and we're trying to get um, values or cutoff values. And perhaps we'll have more data about this in the future. We're trying to use it for the PCL as well. Menisci, we're done with this. We don't do this anymore. We do this. We try and tell you whether there is degeneration or a tear. Okay. If there is a tear, what is the morphology? Where is it located? What is the extent? What is its distance from the periphery? Is the root involved or no? Now, we may not always be right, but 80% of the times we can give you all of this information before the surgery is done. And the reason we can do that is because we do these volumetric images. We take an entire volume of the meniscus and we reconstruct it like this in the plane of the meniscus. So if you look at it, you can actually see the C-shaped structures of the meniscus. Now, once I get an image like this, it becomes very easy to identify the other things that we spoke about in the earlier slide. For example, I can see now this, look, this is the lateral meniscus, nice and clean. I can see this tear. I can see this tear. So I know the extent, or at least the approximate extent. I know what its distance is from the periphery. I know that this root is not involved. Okay. Or in this radial tear, I know that there is, it's a full thickness radial tear. Or in this bucket handle tear, I know that this part has displaced inside, but the root is intact and so on. Root tears, this is something what we call as aunt mini radiology. You see it once, you should not miss it. Although Sachin just told me I missed one the other day. But you don't, so you normally where you should see the anterior horn, you don't see anything. So this is the ghost meniscus sign where you don't see the meniscus at all. And the reason for this is because that part Finally, the cartilage. Now, I always add a cartilage map, especially when I'm looking at young patients, simply because sometimes the regular, our regular PD images don't give you the correct size of the lesion. They don't tell you anything about the adjacent cartilage. Sometimes you may not be able to pick up what the status of the adjacent. And then I get a call from the surgeon saying, you know, you said it was five millimeters by eight millimeters and it turned out to be 15 by whatever. Right. The reason for that is because I have not seen the adjacent cartilage and sometimes that is diseased and all of that has to be debrided. Right. So this just adds a little bit of certainty to the size of the lesion. Defects are well seen. Chondromalacic changes are well seen. And MR is useful for assessment of osteoarthritis to decide whether it is a unicompartment involvement and what the uh, condition of the ACL is and so on. This was a 40 year old gentleman who had pain during running. Cartilage should look gray. And instead of that, there is this nice, big, full thickness defect on the undersurface of the medial femoral condyle. On the coronal images, that's all normal. And I see this big defect. There's a little shallow defect on the opposite side as well, on the medial tibial condyle. But when I add a cartilage map to it, first of all, if you look at this size and you look at this size, this looks bigger. Secondly, so what happens is we have a color scale here which tells you desiccated cartilage at the bottom and chondromalacic or injured cartilage at the top of the scale. So the higher the value that we get in that cartilage, the more likely it is injured. Okay. So if you look at this cartilage, all of this is fine, but adjacent to the defect, that cartilage starts looking green and blue and the values go to 67 and so on. And so that means that cartilage is injured. So this defect is not just this much, the injury of the cartilage is all of this, okay? And these can also be assessed after surgery very beautifully like this. You see this nice mosaic plasty. You see it very beautifully on the cartilage maps. 
Okay, so to conclude, yeah, first thing, you know, often we get patients for MRI, they come without any clinical history, they come without an x ray, they come without their previous investigations, previous history of surgery, for some reason, they hide the fact that there was a surgery done earlier, or there was an earlier report. Now, it is important to see all of these things, because it is not easy to look for a post operative scan, without knowing what was done on that particular joint. Okay, so all of these things are important. So urge your patients to take all of this stuff with them and give it to the people there when they come for an MRI. If possible, high field strength imaging, at least 1.5 T. Always ask for a CD because you can load the CD into your own um, you know, uh, laptop or desktop and you can window it and you can actually yourself assess the glenoid bone loss and so on and so forth. Try and give a follow-up to the radiologist, especially the negative follow-ups because everybody learns from that. Yeah, It's good to have an interaction because then you learn from your mistakes, you learn where you went wrong, and perhaps you can be a better person at the end of it. Thank you.